I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I'd like to take a moment thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 74 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 074. Wow. Talk about a mouthful today. I have been super busy, but we'll get to that in a moment. First off, I want to give you a carry tip, and that carry tip is perform dry fire drills. Martial artists perform katas to keep their skills from deteriorating. And those that know what they are doing when it comes to the carrying of firearms, they do dry fire drills for the very same reason. They don't want their skills to deteriorate. You know, my personal dry fire drill routine involves Crimson Trace laser grips, a GoPro camera to record the dot, and an unloaded firearm. Now, I do have some tips for you when you perform your dry fire drills. First and foremost, do not use your primary or backup carry guns for dry fire practice. This is for safety more than anything else because when you're unloading the gun, you may forget to clear the chamber and leave a round in the chamber when you're doing your dry fire drill and it's not so much a dry fire as it is live fire. And the other reason it's a safety issue is you may leave a round in the chamber when you may forget to put a round into the chamber when you're reloading. Now, if you are unloading your primary weapon and you keep rechambering the same round over and over again, then you run the risk of bullet setback. Now, I recommend that when you are doing your dry fire drills, I strongly recommend that you dress as you normally would. You perform your dry fire drills. You use a gun in one room. with a, In my case, I use it with a mirror. That's because the GoPro camera catches the angle from the side and the target because the mirror is also positioned so that it it's complicated, but... I get to see both sides and where I'm putting the rounds or where I would be putting the rounds on target. Now, this lets me analyze what I'm doing, and it gives me a pretty good idea of where I, I'm making any mistakes. But the reason you want to do your dry fires drill, drills as you are dressed normally is because, well, you want to practice drawing your weapon under as close to the conditions you would when you're out, at, when you're out and about in your daily routine. But hey... That's enough of the carry tip. I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And after that, we'll come back and I'll talk about what all's been going on. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, when I say it's been a busy, or I've, when the, earlier in the show I indicated it, I've been pretty busy, and I have been. Oh, man, I would have recorded this episode sooner, got it out earlier on Monday. Instead, it looks like it'll be out on Tuesday, and that's because I've spent quite a bit of my time today hunting down and eliminating a fake Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You know, this individual, he cloned everything about the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. He took the audio files and he put them up on his website and he inserted a ton of advertisements. And these are completely non-firearm related advertisements. I find that, I found out about it because I got an email from a podcast listing service that apparently he tried to list a podcast with and that particular service sent an email to me because he cloned my RSS feed down to my email address they sent an email to me asking me to confirm uh it was my podcast I thought well that's weird I never signed up for them followed the link and it turns out the information for the gun rights as an R-I-T-E-S podcast was not exactly kosher it tried to install tons of spyware malware and that kind of thing and i am going to say that i felt the need to kind of burn that computer when i was done fortunately i did that on an account that was kind of scrubbed for just that reason i was able to kill the account and the computer is still relatively safe but i spent quite a bit of time tracking down who was hosting the fake gun rights in texas podcast and after talking to their tech support people, they figured out this guy was, was cloning a number of different gun rights uh, 
not podcasts, but a number of gun rights websites. And, well, we went through and contacted all of them. And everybody that was involved knows about it. We're kind of keeping details of it. Kind of, We're kind of playing those close to the vest. But if you found this podcast by going to some other weird random website, please don't worry. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is still here. We're still alive. And it's spelled R-I-G-H-T-S, not R-I-T-E-S. I would like to point out that he wasn't using a .com domain or a .org or a .net, too. If you didn't get this podcast from a .com, then you need to go to gunrightsintexas.com, not dot .something something dot .something something, and download it there. But enough of that. I think it's time we run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media, and then we'll be back with a little... We're going to kind of cover some listener feedback. And, well, I'll be back in a moment. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. You know, the reason I say we're doing the listener feedback right now instead of the topic is because listener feedback led to the topic. Of all the episodes this podcast has released, the one that people request a sequel to the most is the reloading episode, which is number 31, which was shortly after we rebranded the podcast from the Open Carry Report to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You know, people have been asking me a lot, especially this last two weeks, to go into detail about reloading presses more than anything else. So, let's talk about some pressing matters, shall we? You know, there are three different types of presses that most people will encounter. The first is the single-stage press. This is the traditional uh, press that you see, like the uh, Redding or the RCBS. That's just a big old loop or a C-shaped cast steel thing with a handle and a ramrod, as well as the necessary leverage to make it all work. Well, this is a good design. It's a powerful design, and it does a good job. It does teach skills to reload better than other presses, in my opinion, because it forces you to do one task at a time. Now, a lot of people will say this is the preferred press for hand loaders because they're paying more attention to detail, and they want to concentrate on that one tiny little piece of detail for every uh, pull of the handle. And I don't blame them. When I'm reloading rifle rounds, I use use a single-stage press. When I'm reloading 44 mag, I use a single-stage press. And you may wonder, why would I use a single-stage press for a handgun cartridge if I got a progressive, which I do. The reason for that is the 44 mag cartridge kind of scares me when it comes to reloading. It's way too easy to get an overpressure charge in that particular case. I have a few friends who have done it. Fortunately, they didn't destroy their guns or lose any digits on their hands. But that won't always be the case if people continue to keep overloading their cases or overcharging their cases. And, the, you know, if you're really going through and you're loading a lot of ammunition on a progressive press, even with, you know, certain safety features added to it, you still run the risk of causing things not to work right or doing things wrong. And when you're dealing with cartridges that are at such high pressures like the 44 mag, it's always safer to run them with you know, a more precise load. And that's why I use the single stage press for that. Now, some people may ask, well, what's a hand loader? Because you brought that up. Well, hand loaders are a subcategory of reloaders who produce a much more precise cartridge when they reload. Everything is, there's far more attention to detail for hand loaders than there are just generic reloaders. You know, there are different brands available for single stage presses. I'm going to name three. There's the Lee Press, which it's a cheap entry level press. There's the RCBS, which is my personal preference, and mine has a Hornady lock and load bushing conversion, so I can use Hornady lock and load bushings in it. This is, in my opinion, something that's kind of important to do. And then you have Hornady presses. Hornady presses are even better, than, according to a lot of people, but in my opinion, the RCBS is the standard. There's also Redding presses and others, but for me, I want to go with the RCBS. 
Now the next type of press is the turret press. This is an intermediate step between a progressive and a single stage press. You still work on one cartridge at a time and you still do one task at a time. However, depending on the type of press, you may do you may load one cartridge completely before moving on to another or you may not. It all depends on if you have an auto indexing press or a manual indexing press and if you have a manual indexing press if you want to use it like an auto indexing or if you want to use it like a single stage. With an auto indexing press when you pull the handle it turns the turret and well the dies themselves move so that the next die you need is in place so when you pull the handle again you're using the next stage in the reloading process and then when you're done it turns the dies once more and you continue until you're done. Now a manual indexing press there's no automatic turning of the turret. You have to manually turn the turret each time you want it to change. A lot of people with these manual indexing turret presses tend to use them as a fancy single stage press. Some people say you lose a little bit of precision in those but who knows. It's nothing I really don't have one. I did have one, but you know, I've got other presses I use for other things and I let that one go. You know, as far as I can as far as I can recommend and as far as I know, there's only one decent quality auto indexing turret press, and that's the Leap Precision Classic Turret Reloading Press. And this is the if somebody asked me to recommend a turret press for a beginning reloader, it would be the Lee Precision Classic Turret Reloading Press. The reason you want the Classic is it's made tougher than the regular turret reloading press. Now there are options for non-indexing presses or non-auto indexing presses, and the two that really stand out above the others are the RCBS and Reading designs. But then you also have progressive presses, and this is what I tend to use for reloading most handgun cartridges. Some folks will say these are the pinnacle of reloading presses, and there's three brands that I strongly recommend people consider. The first is the RCBS. They have a lot of different presses in the uh, in the progressive category. I think they have like three if I last I knew. Then there's the Hornady, which is what I use, and then there's the Dillon Precision, which is probably depending on which model you go with, going to be a better fit for a lot of people, but it's going to be a it's going to be a lot tighter fit for a lot of people's wallets too. Now, when you come to progressive presses, you do find there are some standard features. There are shell plates which replace the uh, the cartridge holder or the case holder in the regular turret and and single stage press. The shell plate actually turns the cartridge rather than the head of the press turning. There's almost always going to be an automatic primer feeder. There's going to be a cartridge catch bin, although on cheaper presses, such as the Lee models, you don't see these. And you'll find on some, but not all brands, an interchangeable tool head. Now, the tool head is uh, the equivalent to the turret in a turret press. And the tool head is what holds all the dies. Now, if you have a press that has a removable uh Tool head. Make sure that you match the tor the, uh, the number of dies to the number of shells that the shell plate can hold. Now there are standard accessories that people recommend or use on a progressive press, and these would be an auto bullet feed die and a auto bullet feed system. In the show notes, I'll just do it as die slash system. And there's an auto case feed system. Now these load things for you so that you don't have to do them on your own. Personally, I don't like to use those. Well, I don't like to use the motors on those. Let me put it that way. On my Hornady press, I've got the Hornady bullet feed die with a piece of PVC pipe stuck in it that basically acts as a gravity-based bullet feed mechanism. And I can load about 50 rounds and I stop. That's a good number. After 50 rounds, I stop, I load some more, uh, I load more bullets into the tube, I check everything, make sure I'm good, 50 more rounds, I reload the tube, and then I also load the primers again. Now, there are some recommended safety accessories, and I strongly recommend a powder check die, whether it's a lockout die like I use, 
And for the lockout die, use an RCBS powder lockout die. Or if it's a just a powder check die that puts up a small flag if you got it right, it doesn't matter what you use as long as you're paying attention and you won't go wrong with it. I also recommend a lighting kit. Lighting kits let you inspect each case and you can get a better idea of what's going on with your press as you're using it. Now, I'm not going to include any links to manufacturers for presses or anything like that. You can go into your favorite search engine, whether it's Bing or Google or Yahoo or whatever, and you can type in RCBS, Hornady, Dylan Precision, uh, Lee Precision, I believe, is Lee's website, or is what Lee operates under. Or you can type in Reading, and you can find all their websites. Now, I am wanting to make this a short episode because I'm kind of short on time. So I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. And then I want to come back, I want to hit the news, and then we're going to wrap the show up. With that said, here's how to get in touch. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292 Six seven three six. Well, we're going to do our traditional three news stories, and then we're going to close out the show. Our first news story comes to us from Temple, Texas, where the police chief of Marlin, Texas, was listed in critical but stable condition after receiving a gunshot wound to the head on Sunday morning. And I am recording this on Monday night. Now, he was shot while working uniform security at the laid-back lounge in Temple, Texas. The suspect, Derek Wayne Gamble, was in custody and is facing mm, aggravated assault on a peace officer charges. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, this is, this is horrible to see. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm one of those that I'm a big fan of helping out police officers. I'm a big fan of making sure that they don't overstep their limits, too. But I find it interesting that this officer is working uniform security and he's the police chief. Uh, Something just doesn't seem right there, and I'm wondering if the uniform security means he was in his uh, law enforcement uniform or if he had some kind of security guard uniform. If he is working uniform security to make ends meet, that makes you wonder how well Marlin, Texas, is paying their police officers. But, you know, that just doesn't seem right that the police chief would be working uniform security. You would think they would be more interested in you think a city would pay their police chief enough that he would concentrate strictly on being the police chief. And the other thing that strikes me is, I don't know anything about this Derek Wayne Gamble, but what they posted in the article, and I believe they said he's 24 years old, I am almost willing to bet that if you dig deep into this guy's history, you'll find he has a criminal background. Because you don't just graduate to shooting a cop in the head, or as in some news stories reported, in the face, straight from being a perfectly good law-abiding citizen. You don't make that jump. Then again, he may be one of those that never got caught, too. But anyways, I want to say we're going to keep uh, we're going to keep the Marlin police chief in our prayers, and I'm going to ask that the listeners do the same if they're if they're the kind that offer prayers, and if they're not, well, do whatever it is that your beliefs cause you to do. Now we're going to move on to to our pol- politics category we got two articles in it. The first story comes to us from the Dallas Morning News, and it warns colleges that designated gun-free classes could result in lawsuits. The article goes into more detail, but I'd also like to warn those same colleges that um, designated gun-free classes could result in more legislation to limit your capability to have gun-free zones. Yeah, I think you might want to pay attention to that. And then moving on, Texans will soon be able to carry a handgun with a license openly. But many knives, I want to change how that's worded. I want to change it so that it's Texans will soon be able to openly carry a handgun with a license. But many knives, like the Bowie knife, are still illegal to carry. Now, I'm a big fan of having the right to carry a knife. And I'm not going to go into details, but there are ways around some of the knife carry prohibitions. We have made progress. We got preemption for knives, but there are other things we need to, we need to do to advance the uh, 
rights of knife owners in Texas. You know, with that said, I'm going to go ahead. I want to wrap this episode up. It's going to be a short 15, 20 minute episode because I just really don't have time to do more tonight. And I still have to contact a few people and see exactly what they're wanting to do on the, uh, on the fake version of their website. Like there was the fake gun rights in Texas podcast. Yeah, that's kind of a sore point for me. However, with that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. For those who notice the different segments have different audio properties, maybe you might notice them, you may not. Let me say that all these episodes, or all these segments were, were recorded at separate times, and they were not recorded in order. And I just want to make sure that that's clear. And, well, I still got a few segments to record. So let me, let me stop this recording and move on and record the, do some laundry or do a little more cleaning, and record another while that's other stuff's doing its thing. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly.